Okay, welcome back. Um, I hope that these are helping you. And if you have any suggestions, please let me know. Um, we are working on hopefully getting a little bit better at this. So let me start off by saying um, we are starting a new unit. This is chapter three. Um, this is our unit 10. There are going to be three chapters in this. So um, I kind of hope that these help you keep up um, in the next month. Remember our test for biology in um, room C5 for Mr. Price is going to be on May 31st. So um, make sure you're keeping up with the lessons and um, also that you're trying to go through that um, unit 10 lesson review on Moodle so that you can kind of learn the terms as we go and maybe even get ahead a little bit. So here we go. Some of the things. Um, when we're going to start today and in class, we were talking about what is ecology. Well, ecology is basically taking those bigger pictures and going, how do we take all the stuff that we've learned from cells um, through mitosis and meiosis and cell division and then moving into DNA and RNA and photosynthesis and cellular respiration, um, Punnett squares, genetics, um, evolution and classification and how do we apply that to the bigger and larger picture and how we do that is um, we take all of the stuff that we know and try to apply it and tie it all together to form a bigger, bigger picture on what's going on with our environment um, and with all of our biomes and all the things that we're going to talk about in this slideshow. The next part is ecologists and biologists and um, we have taken about 1.8 million different species on this planet and given them a binomial nomenclature scientific name and run them through our taxonomy which we went over in um, classification in the last um, unit and there are many more to go and I put, pose to you this um, idea in class today that we are looking so far in our biosphere and there are certain professors and doctors that are working in England at Cambridge and Oxford that are taking this a step further and starting to pose questions of what are other ecosystems on other planets going to look like and how will that change our definition of what we know as life so just kind of an intriguing question as we move along here um, first of all the three things that we use to study ecology as biologists um, and ecologists the first one is pretty simple it's observation you go out you see things um, and you start making um, observation about it. then you can start posing questions a lot of times we'll look at behaviors such as mating behaviors um, and how things are interacting within a given um, environment and try to make sense of those and to make useful predictions once we kind of done the observation step we take it to the next part, part and we start experimenting and forming a hypothesis and going through the scientific um, method and try to simulate maybe some of those behaviors um, in a lab and start experimenting and manipulating to create more of an expectation. Remember our, our goal in science and in biology is to make useful predictions about what's going to happen um, in the environment and part of that is experimenting and running through a whole bunch of simulations and we'll do some um, using explorelearning.com to um, do some artificial simulations but there are people that go out and actually experiment and try to manipulate um, actual environments to try to get a better picture of what would actually happen if something were to arise in that area. The last one, um, one of the last three uh, methods of how we study ecology is modeling and the best one I can give you again it's kind of far-fetched as the movie goes along but if you've seen the day after tomorrow they put in a model of what ha would happen if the ocean currents would stop going from um, moving warm water from the equator to the north parts of North America in the Atlantic Ocean to over to Europe and then once it you know starts to cool off it becomes very dense and that conveyor belt of current drops and sends that cold water back down to um, the equator to be rewarmed back up and it's just a nice cycle and they put that um, information into um, a model in the day after tomorrow and created what would happen in this model of climate changes that would occur if those ocean currents up. So modeling is a big one and we try to figure out what is going to happen um, long term if we keep doing some of the behaviors as humans and even if we were you know what would happen if we lost some of the producers or the grasses and things in certain ecosystems and this is kind of an introduction to get going but the three things again are 
of observation, looking at um, certain species in an environment, then we start experimenting either artificially or actually out there manipulating certain things. And then we'll try to model those things to create better expectations. Um, some of the tools that we're going to use um, in observations, obviously you have a field site you're going to look at, experiments, you're going to have plots, you're going to mark off areas. Um, and then in the lab, we can also do some experimentations. And then over here on modeling, you see many sites for collecting data, and that's where those Microsoft um, Office Excel skills come in. Uh, measuring tools, all kinds of different things, tapes, compasses for um, field observations, um, thermometer sensors. Um, I know that those of you have Mrs. Dodds, she's got some sensors set up for seismic activity in a room. Those are come some observation tools. Um, some of the same things kind of overlap here. The kind of cool one for modeling is these aerial views and the global positioning stuff. Now that we have all these GPS, we can now measure better um, some of the data that we're collecting and how some of the climate, why there's been so many tornadoes here in the last um, year in the Midwest. And we're starting to create a better model of why that's happening and understanding why that's happening. Uh, magnifying tools, again, you know, simple tools out in observation because you don't want to get too close to creatures and interfere with what they're naturally doing. Binoculars, microscopes, telescopes, and um, you got all these cool tools that um, a lot of you know and have used before. Written records um, are a big one. And again, as scientists, we've got to be really um, objective with what we're doing and make sure that our data is matching up with our hypothesis without any um, agenda with that and most good scientists will do that and be very skeptical even if they get good data. Um, chemical testing, you got test kits out in observation, you can test the pH um, of rivers, you could try to manipulate in a lab um, some of those pH balances in rivers and um, take a small sample and bring it in the lab and see what pHs may be in a pond. Um, large data, multiple sensors, again, that global positioning thing for modeling becomes huge. And you got to have large amounts of computer space to, to do those. So last one, calculators and that kind of stuff. Again, why I'm showing this slide, and I didn't show it in class, was observation. These are the things we're going to use to make our quality observations experiment. We're going to make sure that, one, it's safe and we're not harming anything. Um, some of the tools that we use in the modeling, again, is kind of the fun one and the new one with all our technology with GPS and creating bigger models to make better predictions. So <clears throat> very quickly, I want to show you what levels we um, use for organization, uh, bioserve, biome, ecosystem, community, population, and um, organisms and species. And please understand that each one of these builds up towards the largest, which is biosphere. Um, and then we'll go through each one of these as we go down. Quickly, individual, we can study an individual species. We'll study also a group, a population in a defined area. Community, we're adding all the biotic, the living factors. Ecosystem, we compare the biotic factors and the abiotic factors, the living and the non-living. Biome, again, a biome is like the tundra, which is here. And then biosphere, all the living parts of our planet. So quickly going through some of these. Uh, biosphere is the largest, and again, as we start becoming aware of other livable places in our um, galaxy, I'm sure that this will change. But the biosphere is the life-supporting region of the Earth. Again, we talked about eight kilometers in the atmosphere, 11 kilometers below the ocean surface. I'm sure those numbers will change as we move along. Two important factors here. Biotic factors, although they're non-living, please remember it's the amount of water, it's the type of soil, the amount of sunlight in a given year, the temperature because of the sunlight amount or less, and then the types of gases like CO2, oxygen available in that ecosystem. And then the biotic factor is very simple. It's all the living things that are included here in our kingdoms, plants, animals, protists, fungus, eubacteria, archaea. So it's not going to only be about how the biotic factors um, are involved and compared to each other, but it's how those biotic factors interact with each other and also interact with those abiotic factors. Next one is biome, and biomes are pretty simple. It's a group of ecosystems that have similar climates and similar dominant communities, meaning they're similar life forms or similar biotic factors. And think of a biome as a region such as tundra, um, we live in a high desert um, grassland. We have the polar region. We have um, some alpine regions and other places. And I'll show you some of those on this. So again, oceans, you got coral reefs, which is its own biome. You got 
um, tropical rainforests and savannas all over the world. You got the traditional tropical rainforest here and near the Congo, um, tropical or deciduous forest here in North America, and a lot of Europe is that. Biral forest, which is extending to Alaska all the way in Canada, and then across Europe and Asia. Those are those evergreen forests. Um, temperate grassland, notice that that's where we are, and there's a lot of that um, on the other side of the Himalayas. Um, subtropical desert, not a lot of rain there, and soil contents really high salinity. And then you got your uh, shrublands here down in Argentina and Chile, and then you got some of that right around here, um, also called the Mediterranean in this area. Um, you'll see little pockets of certain things, and your uh, question was asked today. There are little islands of certain things throughout here, so know that within like the Hawaiian Islands, they might have all of these things within that small region. Um, Alpine, if you look at the Himalayas, that's that area above the forest that um, it's really cold and um, small organisms like lichen can get on to rocks and survive. Um, then of course you got our, ta our uh, excuse me, our tundra, and then up here are other polar ice caps. Ecosystem, the best one I can give you is a fish tank. Um, it's a definite, defined area. Please understand that when we look at ecosystems, we're looking at how the biotic factors of living interact with those abiotic factors. So someone looking at an ecosystem would manipulate the abiotic factors and see how those biotic factors, the living, would react accordingly. So these are just some examples, and you might see this word pop up, habitat. It's the type of environment that a particular species live, live. It's the things that they need to survive and how they interact with those abiotic factors, which are these down here, to survive. So again, ecosystem. Um, a couple things about ecosystems. Notice that I want to point out the sunlight and the water, very important parts of soil content, even in the um, ocean here, and how these things interact to um, produce a viable and healthy ecosystem. So how the living interact with all of the things that are non-living. Community is pretty simple. If you're looking at a community, you're studying the interaction between populations or the interactions between all the biotic life forms. And again, go back to those seven kingdoms. Um, it includes how archaea, bacteria will interact with bacteria all the way down to plants, animals, fungus, um, protists, and other things will interact. What a community is, it's an assembly or assemblages of different populations that live together, all of the living stuff. It's just the living. And the point I want to make here is, if we're looking at the wolf and elk population, we want to define that area. So I've defined that area as the state of Idaho here. Um, goldfish and upside down catfish in my fish tank in the back of the room, that's a definite defined area. And we can see how those goldfish and those upside down catfish, if we were doing a study on a community, would inter interact with each other. So again, we tend to forget about our plants. Please don't forget about our plants. They're an important part of our communities. In fact, as we go further, you'll see that the producers are the most important parts um, moving through here. Populations, um, populations are all members of a species that live in the same area. We're only talking about a specific species. So again, my population of goldfish in the back living in my defined area of my fish tank and Canis lupus, again, in my defined area, the Stanley Basin region, would be my population. Um, Homo sapiens or humans in C5 would be studying how our classes interact in a defined area in my classroom. So again, my goldfish, um, Chinook salmon, how they interact and go clear up the redfish lake, we might look at that. This is my defined population of humans. And then our last um, one here today, we can take an individual organism, and my example was, we could go and look at a specific tree year to year and see how the Cambrian changes and look at those tree rings and see how those tree rings might change from year to year and what causes those change. You might see a big um, growth in that year and you might talk about why that growth is bigger or you might see a very small line of growth and talk about you know maybe that year didn't have as much rainfall. So we're looking at, as a species, just the genus species, and we might look at one ponderosa pine, we might look at one canis lupus. They have marked a lot of wolves in Idaho and tracked them and look at their behavior just as a single organism. And there are people that study us um, and see how we interact with our environment. So one person and how they interact with their environment. So I hope that helps. Um, here are some questions to make sure that you are checking. What are the three methods that ecologists use to study ecology? Give you a little second here to go through that in your mind. They are observation, experimenting, and modeling. 
And then what are the levels of ecology studied? Again, they are in um, order from largest to smallest, biosphere, the biome, ecosystem, community, population, and organism. I hope that helps and thanks.